Okay, here's our example that we did last week that deals with an order that contains pizzas. And let's compile it and make sure that it works. And then we'll look at the code. So we can compile it. Compiles cleanly. And we can run it. And it tells us that we have two pizzas. First one is thin crust. The bake time is 10 minutes. The second one is, uh, is large and has pepperoni. It doesn't have pepperoni, rather, and the cost is $10. This one, the cost is, or the crust is uh, thick, so the bake time is 16 minutes. Uh, it's large, it has pepperoni, so the cost is $12, and the order cost is $2. Okay, $22. I'm not reading very well today. So, we had our pizza class. Our pizza class has three attributes. A string for the size, string for the crust, and a string for has pepperoni. Now, I realize that there are some holes in here as far as the validation goes. We're not terribly worried about validation right now. We will talk about that more when we start talking about exception processing. Um, so we're just making sure when we code this that we do everything by the book, all right? We have two constructors on the pizza class. How do I know these are constructors? Well, their name, they look like a method, but two differences. The name of the method is the same as the class. So that's one way you can know it's a constructor. The other way you know it's a constructor is that there's no return value associated with it. All right, so this is a constructor. A constructor is the code that is used to sort of create and initialize an object. An object is a member of this class, an instance of this class. These are called instance variables because there's one of these per pizza. There's a, there's a set of these per pizza. Every pizza has a size associated with it, has a type of crust, and has a Boolean that says whether it has pepperoni. We can set these attributes right when we make the pizza. So when we make the pizza, we can call the pizza constructor and give it a size, a kind of crust, and whether it has pepperoni. And those attributes get set as soon as that pizza is made. So the pizza is made, the memory is allocated, those instance variables get set, and we have a pointer to this object on the heap. We have the same thing with a two-argument constructor, uh, but we don't have a, uh, and we default the, the pepperoni value to true. So we assume if you give the two arguments instead of three, that the pepperoni uh, value is set to true. We have sets and gets for different for each of the attributes to set size and to get size so we can change those values remember is a good idea to make these variables private the reason for that is we want to control the way other programs access those fields we don't want other programs going in and changing those values to something that doesn't make any sense Later on, we're going to put validation in these set methods. And we're going to make sure that the only way you can give the crust a value, for example, is to go through the set method for crust. Likewise size, likewise has pepperoni. All right? So we're going to make sure that there's no way that you can 
give these things illegal values by writing validation in these methods. But because they're private, we have to give these methods as an ability to set the values of those variables and finally to get the value of those variables. We have a couple other methods in here. One is to calculate the bake time, which is simply based on a simple rule that if it's a thin crust it takes 10 minutes to bake, if it's a thick crust it takes 16 minutes to, to, to bake. Secondly, we calculate the cost of the pizza, which is for small pizzas, six dollars, eight for medium, twelve for large, add two to the price of the pizza if there's pepperoni on it. All right, and then finally we return the cost. Notice that cost doesn't have any arguments. Why doesn't it have any arguments? Because the only thing you need to do the calculation are these things right here. All right, those attributes. Those attributes will be set by the constructor because we've only allowed for two possible constructors. So there's only two ways that we can create a pizza. We use the constructor that has three arguments. We use a constructor that has two arguments. And even if we only use a constructor that only has two arguments, we're still setting all the properties because we're defaulting the pepperoni to true. All right. This is a class that we've worked with probably the longest in here. Um, let's look at the other two classes and then, then I'll see what kind of questions you have. This is an order class. If you think about it, an order to a pizza shop consists of a name, maybe an address, a phone number, whether or not it's for delivery, and then finally, a list of pizzas on that order. Now notice what the list of pizzas are. The list of pizzas are pizza objects. Remember that the pizza class is a template for all pizzas. All right? It's a description of what every pizza has, what functions it can perform, what attributes it has, and so on. An order is really this information plus a list of pizzas. And those are pizza objects. Again, the pizza class makes a component that anywhere in this application that we need a pizza, all right, or list of pizzas, we're going to use a pizza object. Some students, when they do this, will think, well, I'll put a string in there that maybe says, like, the size of the pizza and whether it has pepperoni or not. No. You're Plugging into this class, this class has a list of pizzas associated with it. And the only way that we're going to represent pizzas is with the pizza, by using a pizza class to create pizza objects. All right? We have two constructors. One accepts a name, a phone number. And it assumes that it's not for delivery. Probably a good assumption, right? If you're not getting an address, you're probably not delivering it to it. So it defaults the address and the delivery flag. The other one accepts all four arguments. All right. And then finally, I have a series of methods that allow me to maintain the order. That is, put pizzas in the order. I have an add pizza method, which takes a pizza argument. Again, anywhere we're dealing with pizzas, we're not going to deal with a string that describes what's on the pizza or anything like that. We're going to describe, we're going to use a pizza object to have a pizza. That way we can do anything to that pizza object that we can do to any pizza. So if I want to know the bake time, if I want to know the cost, I simply ask the pizza object, what's your cost? What's your bake time? So this function to add a pizza to the order accepts as an argument a pizza object. And what does it do? It adds that pizza object to the array list of pizzas. The array list for pizzas is called list of pizzas. All right. What would that pizza object look like? I mean, what would it in the argument that's been passed in? Like, what would that argument look like? It would be simply an object reference variable. 
So if we did this, and we'll see this in the unit test, but I could have code like this. Pizza P equals new pizza. And I could give some value to the constructor. Or I could give some sets or whatever. Because it's a pizza object, I can add, I can add to my order that pizza object. And I can say, oh. Add pizza. So the short answer to your question is anything that has been created as a pizza object is what I can add to that and what will be the argument for that. OK. So we add to the list of pizzas an argument that contains the pizza that the person ordered. To calculate the cost of the pizza, we loop through every pizza on the list. And we use this syntax. This is a for next loop, which you've probably seen before, right? In C sharp. For int equals zero means that I, or I'm sorry, for int i equals zero means that I will initially have a value of zero. So the first time through the loop, I will have a value of 0. You continue this loop as long as i is less than list of pizzas dot size. All right? Size is a method on the array list class. Size returns how many pizzas are in, or not how many pizzas, in this case it's pizzas, how many items are in the array list. All right? So if the person ordered three pizzas, there would be three pizzas in the array list. And the size of the array list then would be three. All right? Each time through the loop, we're adding one to i. So if there were three pizzas in this array, in this array list, would run through the loop once when I had a value of 0, would run through it again when I had a value of 1, would one run through it again when I had a value of 2, at that point would increment i to 3. 3 is no longer less than the, the, number of, uh, the size of that array list, so we would drop out of the loop. All right? Remember, the index of an array list, it's like an index of an array, it starts at zero. All right? And the number, or the size, is the number of elements. So an array list that has a size of five has elements numbered zero, one, two, three, and four. All right? An array list that has ten elements would have a, a elements of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So the maximum subscript is always one less than the size. That's why this is as long as i is less than that. Because we're going to go up to it, but we're not going to, we're, we're going to go almost up to it, but we're not going to go up to the size of the array. So what do we do? The get method, when we give it a index, gives us the pizza in that position of the array list. So the very first time through the array list, we get the pizza sub zero, which is the first pizza that we added to the array list. The next one is pizza one, pizza two, pizza three, and so on. So for however many pizzas we get, each time through the loop, we're going to get the next pizza in the array list, and we're going to have access to it. Now notice that this says pizza p equals list of pizzas get. This is not creating any pizza objects. This is simply getting a pointer to the pizza objects that are in memory. All right, that have already been created and already have been added to this order. 
each time through the list, we ask that pizza item, hey, what is your cost? Because each thing in the array list is a pizza object, we can call any methods associated with a pizza, including what is your cost? So we can get the cost of that pizza, we can add it to our cost total, and when we're done, this cost variable is going to contain the total cost for all the pizzas in the order. Because we're going to look at each pizza in order, starting with the 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, for as many pizzas are on the list, and we're going to ask for each pizza, give me your cost, let's add that cost to the total. When we're finally done, we look to see, excuse me, if the, the order is delivery or not. And if it's a delivery, we charge an extra two dollars. And then finally we return the cost. Okay, so what would keep that? Because in our calculate cost, we are adding in delivery for each pizza that's being delivered. No, no we're not. Because if you notice, calculate cost, the one that adds two dollars, is doing it is a calculate cost method on the order. Because the pizza calculate cost doesn't look anything at the whether the pizza is being delivered or not. All right. That's that's a good question though. All right. Yes. So for this example, the pizza is the template, right? That's how you said it before. Or the order is the template. Well, both of them are templates for that particular class, right? The pizza class supplies all the information that we know about a pizza. The order class supplies all the information we know about an order. So they're both templates for pizza classes and order classes. We have to test this out to make sure that this works. So I didn't test this out thoroughly, but I made a couple pizzas using the constructors. One's a large pizza with a thin crust with no pepperoni. One's a large pizza with a thick crust and with pepperoni. I didn't have to call that anymore. I outputted some of the parameters for the pizza. Then I went and created a new order, created an order, new order, mic, and the phone number, which means that this constructor got called, which defaulted delivery to false. I add each pizza to that order. Order, add pizza, order, add pizza. Then I ask the order what the total cost is for the order. And then it goes through, calculates the cost of each pizza that's associated with the order. If it's delivery, it adds $2 to it. And then finally, it, it returns of the cost of the order. Now I mentioned last time we should put in some other methods for the orders. We should put gets and sets for all attributes. This might be a good thing to practice. Think for a second, what will the set method for the name look like? Is it going to be public or private? Public, right? Because our functions are t oftentimes public, not always. But it's the variables, the instance variables that we make private. Does the set name method return anything? No. So we say public void. What would be a good name for the set name method? Set name. Set name, thank you. Do notice, though, that the S is lowercase and the N is, is uppercase. All right, that's sort of the standard for method names. Camel casing? Camel casing, yes. Just like we notice below, add pizza. 
Will this accept an argument? Yes. It makes sense, right? We're going to write a function that is going to set the name of that attribute, to give that attribute a value. Well, what value? Well, we have to tell it what value. So that has to be passed in as an argument. What do we put in when we define an argument? What are the two things that we, we, we put in the declaration? We have to have the type of the argument. The type, and then the name of the argument. By convention, I put arg in front of the argument names. That's certainly not a requirement, but it kind of helps me to keep things straight. So then what's the body of the function going to look like? We're going to take the name, we're going to take the argument, and store it in the attribute called name. So this allows us to set the name of or set the value of the name attribute associated with an order. And yeah, I have that in the constructor too. We can also set it through the constructor. But remember, our job is to build a component that we can handle, all right? And can be versatile. So we're going to do this for all of our attributes. So we have a set address one. It's going to look about the same. Set phone. And finally, one for delivery. So sets accept an argument. The argument matches the type of the variable. Doesn't return anything. And sets. the value of the attribute. Now this is a boolean, not a string. So the type matches the type of the attribute. We're going to take the argument and store it in the attribute. The name of the function will be set, the name of the attribute, and it's probably not going to return anything. Get methods. Those allow us to get the value of a method. Those will return something. They'll return the data type of the attribute. It will not have an argument, though because we're not setting anything. Now it's not going to return a string, it's going to return a boolean. 
We need these again because we want to build a very flexible, good component that anyone could use. So not only do we give constructors, we give set methods as well. Questions about this? Let's say we wanted to give a method, create a method on the order that told us how long it will take to bake the entire order. Now here's a catch. All right? Because part of that depends on how big the oven is, right? If we had a tiny oven, we could only make one pizza at a time. So you could only make the order, you know, you have to make the first pizza, second pizza, third pizza. You'd add up the sum of the times. We're going to assume that we have a big enough oven that we can start all three pizzas or however many pizzas at the same time. Now that might not be practical, but that's the assumption we're going to go under. So what would the time of the order, what would the time it would take to prepare the order be? Whatever the greatest number is. So let's create a function on the order table, on the order uh, class, to create, to calculate the bake time. What's that function going to look like? Is that going to be public or private? Public. What's it going to return? Double, probably. Name of the function? Calculate bake time, sure. Will this accept any, does this accept any arguments or not? What arguments do you think it would have? Remember, you only need an argument if you can't get the answer from the list of instance variables. Okay, we don't need an argument. Why not? Right, because all you really need is a list of pizzas. Right? So we don't need an argument here. So, how's this function going to work? Use a for loop. What's the for loop going to look like? What method was that on list of pieces? Size. I plus plus. Should get used to this syntax, right? Because this is the way essentially that you're going to loop through an array or an array list, anything like that. You look at the first element, you do this as long as there are elements that are left. How do you know when there's no elements left? Well, when your i variable is no longer less than the number of elements on the list. And then each time through we increment one. What else do we want to do here? So, someone else. Not that I don't want to hear from you, but give someone else a, a shot. What do we want to do now? Okay. I was going to say an if statement. Okay. I probably will, but I'm, I'm wondering as I'm looking at this, we're going to have to compare what was done in the first item to the second item. Compare what was done with which item? Uh, on the calculate back, uh, back time to find out, to store it somehow so we know if it's the, uh, the longest amount of back time. Okay. All right. So... Let's think about this. Let's say I have a double for the bake time. What can I initialize it to? 
zero. Why do we initialize it to zero? Because all big times are greater than zero, right? So if we only had one pizza on our order, right, that pizza's bake time would be the bake time. How can we do that in an algorithm? Well, we're going to compare each pizza to the previous leader on the leaderboards for longest bake time. And if we initialize it to zero, well, every pizza is going to be bigger than zero, right? Even if it was, you know, I don't know, microwaving a pizza for a minute or something like that, it's still going to be greater than zero. So we initialize the, the bake time for zero. So now what do we want to compare? Yes? If i is greater than bake time, bake time i. OK. If i is greater than bake time, I think you're on the right track. What is i going to be if we have three pizzas? Okay. What we want to do. And it would also be the, the count bake time as well. Okay. We can't just take i. You're on the right track that we want to use i. And maybe you even meant this. Maybe, maybe I just didn't write it. Maybe I wrote down literally what you said and not what you meant. Okay. So I'm not saying you got it wrong. But you're absolutely right. We have to. i is simply the number of the pizza in the list. This is pizza zero. This is pizza one. This is pizza two. This is pizza three. What we have to do is we have to get that pizza. And you could do it a couple different ways. The way I did it above was I said pizza P equals list of pizzas get I. That gives us the pizza in that position. And then I could say P dot get bake time. If get bake time is, or, I, or what is it? Get bake time or calculate bake time? I think it's calculate. Let's calculate bake time. If calculate bake time is greater than bake time, then we have a new leader. And we set bake time equal to P calculate bake time. So what are we doing? We're looping through the list of pizzas. We're saying, OK, to start out, it takes no time to bake this order. We look at all the pizzas. Each trip through the loop, we grab the next pizza on the list. That's what this says. We're not making any new objects. We're simply accessing the pizza from the list of pizzas. So if there were three pizzas, the first two would grab element zero, the first pizza. Is its bake time greater than bake time? Yeah, because we define bake time as zero. So the first one's going to take the lead right off the bat and tell us our bake time is equal to that pizza's bake time. Then we're going to loop through again, and we're going to look to see the second pizza. Is its bake time better than the previous leader? If it is, well, we have a new leader. Otherwise, we don't. Finally, when we're all done, we need to return bake time. Now, this function could really get complicated if we were doing it realistically, right? If we could only bake, let's say, you know, 12 pizzas at a time or, or some number of pizzas at a time. Because we could actually have a, a queue of pizzas waiting to be baked, right? Uh, but again, we're going to simplify it to say that however many pizzas in the order, we're going to assume we can bake them all at the same time, just to, to keep it simple. So how do I test to make sure that this works? Well, I'm going to ask this order.
what the bake time is. So we'll save it. Compile it and run it. Bake time is 16 minutes. Is that correct? Well, yes. The first one, this would have a bake time of 10 minutes. This one has 16 minutes. So the bigger of the two is 16. So we've written some functions on there. OK. I want to review this. I now want to ask you, we'll be, I'm going to skip the thing that you understand well. All right. Um, I'm interested in what you're most confused about in this example. Is there anything in this example that you feel you're the most confused about? That you're not sure why it works a certain way? Yes? The whole functions. Okay. Functions seem to cause a lot of people problems. So I think it's something that um, it is very difficult for me to say, well, you have a function that does that if you really have a hard time with just what even a function does. Okay. So let's look at a couple functions and we'll see what we can come up with. Which of the functions of all of these is the most confusing one for you? Or should I skip this one and do a different example altogether? Different example. OK. All right, let's think of an example of a of a function for a room. All right. All right, a room. A room has what? A width and a length. All right? We'll assume that these are doubles because we could have fractional. So let's say we have rooms that are expressed as the number of feet they are, and you might have fractionals. I don't know, how big would you say this room is? 30 feet maybe, 25 feet by 25, whatever, all right? So let's say we're a carpeting company, and you can create a room, all right? Now, my room has two attributes, a width and a length. I'm going to create a constructor that allows to set the width and the length. I'm going to create a calculate perimeter that allows me to calculate how the room is around. If I was figuring out, like, if I wanted to have whiteboards go all the way around the room, how many whiteboards I would need. All right? Or if I was doing, uh, whatever this stuff is on the bottom. What do you call that? So like a, pardon me? Yeah, whatever he said, the cove base. Or, let's say I want one to maybe carpet the room. 
right? How much carpet would this room require? There's a sale and there's 800 square feet of carpet available. Is that enough for this room? I don't know. So we're going to create a calculate perimeter function, a calculate area function, and a is enough carpet function. So, public class room. has two attributes. They're both going to be private. I'm going to make a constructor. that will allow me to create a room and initialize the two variables all at once. So we're going to set length equals arg length. Width equals arg width. We're going to need some sets and gets. Because even though we have a constructor for them, we want to be able to change and access them. We're going to add to this three quick functions. Calculate perimeter. Calculate area. is enough carpet. Okay, calculate perimeter. We already have the ingredients need to calculate that. Because we can simply return Two times length plus two times width, and that's the perimeter of the room. Calculate the area, same thing. We can calculate that given the length and width. So we can just return that. Is enough carpet though? We need to know how many square feet of carpet that we're trying to use to carpet that room. So we're going to accept an argument that is a double, and this will be the square foot. So this function requires an additional ingredient for it to work. We have to give it not just these attributes. We have to say how much carpeting do we have. And we're going to figure out if it's enough carpet. So if arg square foot is greater than or equal to calculate area 
then we have enough carpet, right? And we can return true. Otherwise, we're going to return false. So here's the functions in this example. I started a little late, so I'm going to go a little bit longer, and then we'll, bring, we'll continue this on Wednesday. Think of each function as you're asking the object to do something. You're either asking it to do something or you're asking it a question. In the case of calculate perimeter, think of it as asking the, the, the object, tell me what your perimeter is. All right? Well, how do we determine the perimeter of something if we know the length and width? Well, it's two times the length plus two times the width. The answer to the question that we're asking is the return value. Okay? That's what the return value represents. And we need to specify the type of the return value. So most of our functions are going to be public, which means that other classes can call them. Many of our functions are going to return something. If it returns something, we specify the type of value that it returns. In this case, it returns a double. All right? Here's the name of the function. And then finally, any arguments. Any arguments are, the arguments are extra pieces of information that the function needs to do its job. Well, this function doesn't need any extra pieces of information to do its job. All it needs is the length and width. And those are already defined as part of the object, right? They're part of the class. So we can simply do the math, 2 times length plus 2 times width, and return that value. So this is the answer. Whatever we return is the answer of the function. And that has to match the return type, which this does. All right? Same thing here. We're returning a double. How do you calculate the area of a room? You take the length times the width. Length times width. We already have those fields associated with each room. So we multiply them together. We return that value. That's the answer. And it is a double because it's one double times another double. This function is a little different. We're asking if we have enough carpet to carpet this room. And the answer is going to be a Boolean. Yes, we do. No, we don't. All right? That's why the return value is a Boolean. It's not a double, because we're not returning an amount of something. We're simply returning a yes or no. If we're asking the question, is there enough carpet, we have to say how much carpet do we have. That's nowhere in the class. That's not one of the attributes, how much carpet is available. So we have to give that to the function as an argument. That's one of the ingredients that this function needs to do its job. Is there enough carpet to calculate this room? Well, I can calculate the, the size of the room, but I don't know how much carpet you have. Well, the function then has to accept that as an argument. So when we call this function, we're going to pass in an argument of the amount of square feet that we have, we're going to look at that square feet. If that is greater than or equal to the area of the room, then we have enough. And we can return our answer, which is true. If we don't have enough, we're going to return the answer is false. So there's three basic things that we need to know to write a function. The name of it, which is pretty easy. We just make up a name that makes sense. The return value, which represents the answer that the function is going to give. And we need to define the type of data that that's going to be. And then finally, the arguments, where the arguments are the extra pieces of information the function needs in order to do its job, other than the width and the length, other than the attributes that already exist in the object, because those have already been set. All right. Now, what we'll do next time is we'll actually look at writing code that calls this function, that creates a room, sets its width and length. 
and then say, okay, we have 200 square feet of carpet. Is that enough to cover this room? And we'll get back a yes or no. So we'll talk about using the functions in the next class. We will continue with this to see if people have other questions about the example that we've been going, uh, going through. Uh, and uh, when we run out of questions, we'll start the next big topic. All right, so I'll see you over in lab.